Keep it. Let's see. All right. It's very bright. It's a little bright. We did not uh, plan effectively. Are we good? We do have slides. And they're cool slides. They're, they're pretty cool. Hi, everybody, and welcome to, oh, I'm getting a little feedback. That makes me sad. Sad, sad, better. Uh, welcome to Preparing for Zero Day. We have an exciting panel here talking about managing vulnerabilities in open source. Uh, let's introduce our panel. Uh, first off, why doesn't Anne introduce herself and talk about the perspective, the persona she's going to be talking from today? Yes, absolutely. And here for a moment, I'll... <laughs> yeah, thanks for being cool with the, the sunglasses. Um, yeah, so my name is Anne Bertuccio. Uh, I'm one of the leads in Google's open source programs office. And kind of how we operate and one of the things we do, we're a small team that really helps all of Google work in open source. So we're kind of frequently teaching folks, this is how things go. You know, here's how you be a good contributor. And that does include vulnerability uh, disclosure. And so that's really kind of the, pers that maintainer perspective is the perspective I'll be speaking from on this panel. Cool. Excellent. Next up is my friend Art. Want to introduce yourselves to sure. those that don't know you? Thanks. Thanks, Krobe. Uh, Art Mannion. I'm at the CERT Coordination Center, the CERT.org, from way back in like 19, 1988. Um, one of the things I spent a lot of time on is coordinated vulnerability disclosure. So the sort of stuff we're talking about on the panel today. Um, I think my persona or role is sort of probably third party coordinator. So I'm not the researcher nor the vendor. We're this middle party that tries to help, sometimes helps, maybe sometimes slows things down, uh, but that's the role that I'll be in today. Excellent. And myself, I'm Krobe. I uh, work with a lot of OpenSSF working groups with the uh, Forum for Incident Response and Security Teams. Uh, I've had the opportunity to work with these fine people, both professionally and in the foundation, for uh, quite some time. I'll be representing the supplier persona. I spent about seven, almost seven years working with Red Hat Product Security, which is one of the largest open source uh, product security teams around. So we got to deal with a lot of these opportunities. Uh, some major exciting things that you probably all had to work with patches and whatnot. So before we start, I want to talk about a little bit of terminology so we're all kind of saying the same thing. Um, first off, we have bug. A bug is an error or a flaw in computer software that causes incorrect or unexpected results or unattended behavior. So this is typically something that uh, you do a bug, you file a report with a the developer, they evaluate it, they fix the bug, they move on. This generally tends to be functional related. Then you have a vulnerability. Vulnerability is a weakness in software, hardware, or an online service that can be exploited and has security implications. So uh, a developer might think of this as a security bug or a vuln, a lot of different ways uh, they might refer to it. This is predominantly what we're talking about as opposed to a, a feature problem. We have uh, CVE, which I think now stands for CVE. <laughs> they changed it. Um, but basically, that's a unique number given to identify a specific security flaw in a piece of software or hardware. And the great thing about CVE is as a consumer of goods and services from multiple vendors, that CVE represents a specific problem. So you can understand what that problem is, how it works, what it does, and you will have multiple vendors that potentially are affected by the same CVE. So if you have um, a, a Dell server and an IBM server and there's CVE 2022-1234 and they potentially both devices could have be affected by the same flaw. Uh, we have a threat which is a potential cause of an incident that may result in harm and then we have uh, the always awesome and much loved embargo which is a period of time where a security flaw is known privately prior to a deadline after which the details become known to the public. And this is a, th a thing that is used uh, both in open and closed source. Um, generally, it's done where a reporter discloses to a maintainer. They agree upon a period of time that maintainer has to work on a fix to uh, correct the issue. And then once it's fixed, normally you go out and have public disclosure. Um, a lot of different opinions and implementations of embargo, but generically, it's designed to help protect the end users of the software or hardware. All right, so 
being my, I'll begin my duties as kind of master of ceremonies. So I want to talk to my friends here. Um, from your perspectives, what actually is a zero day poem? You want to start, Art? Sure. Um, I, I, can, I can say one thing. A, a, a colleague of mine looked into this at one point during one of the heated periods of discussion on the internet. And I, he found, you know, he, being a true cataloger, he found 11 or 12 definitions and looked at them all and sort of did some analysis of it. But fundamentally, it's a surprise. And, and the surprise is um, subjective as to who is surprised. But the concern we would, you would normally have is the maintainer, supplier, vendor, developer gets surprised by usually a public disclosure. So it's off to the races. Vendors had no lead time. Suppliers had no lead time. They're racing to figure out what the problem is, analyze it, work on a fix or a patch. Uh, whoever posted it, depends on what happens there. Um, someone who might want to attack it is off to the races attacking, and it's a giant mess. And there's a uh, lack of authoritative confirmed information. So you know, Twitter is ablaze with discussion, and everyone's running around chasing stuff. Very expensive response when you have a zero day. Mm -hmm. Anything to add, Ann? I think you hit all the. The big points, you know, um, yeah, Pre previously unknown and frequently with, you know, we, or when it is released without a mitigation. Mm -hmm. And I guess the one thing I would highlight is if you are uh, responding to a vulnerability report, uh, you may be actively working on it in private under an embargo, but that doesn't mean that there aren't people that also have this potentially discovered this issue, potentially might be exploiting it. Um, and the format we're going to go through is I'm going to ask a question of the panel. We'll have a conversation. If the audience has any questions along the way, feel free to raise your hand and shout it out. We'll repeat it and try to address it. And we'll also allot time at the end specifically for the audience or the cyber audience, Dylan, to uh, be able to uh, answer questions. My friend Dylan might be watching. <laughs> see. Uh, I got a little build here. I'll get out of the way. Just some more information about Zero days. <laughs> and I'll, I will figure out a way to post this up to the SCED so that anyone that's interested can uh, review the slides. We have a lot of annotations and links for uh, people to look at if they are vulnerability CVD enthusiasts. All right, so my next question, and I'll start with Ann on this one. How do projects share vulnerability information? Is it always the same? They do it differently? What, how, sure how, do we do, how do we share an open source? Yes. So I think, you know, kind of a um, misconception is that there's only one model of vulnerability disclosure. Vulnerability disclosure is just a process for documenting, communicating, and sharing information about a vulnerability. And it quickly gets very philosophical. I think everybody is acting from um, you know, what they believe to be, I'm protecting the user, I'm doing what's going to do that best, but there's wide disagreement about how that should be done. Am I getting feedback? Is that, no, nope, everybody's good? Okay, um, so I think actually we have a little chart. Yeah, you can kind of put things on a sliding scale where, you know, full disclosure, the intent being, I'm going to share this as widely as possible, as quickly as possible, not do something like um, share the information privately beforehand because I think that the sooner the users have this information, the sooner they can take action and that is what's important. On the opposite side of the scale, private disclosure is coming from the idea that, you know, if we widely share this information, an attacker could use it and exploit it before the mitigations are applied. I believe that is not giving a lot of credit to attackers who are very sophisticated. And we have to remind ourselves that our attackers are very sophisticated. So if a researcher found it, you know, to be conservative, we should be operating with the model that there potentially it has already been found by an attacker who also has that information. In the middle is pulling a little bit from both sides is coordinated disclosure, which as a working group uh, in the open SSF is really our recommendation to open source projects for the most part. Um, I know if, what do I say? Uh, There's some very strong feels around it, yes. Yes, and I think we were assured that uh, this room is, uh, folks are here from more than just the kernel, other projects involved, I know the kernel has its own process. Uh, generally, for most projects, our recommendation is coordinated disclosure. Do we have an? Oh, we more? do have another. Do we have another side? Yeah. So the thought being in coordinated disclosure that the best way we can protect users 
is recognizing that the security researcher has once, the project maintainer has once, the project user has once. We're going to balance all those, but also with a lot of respect given to the researcher's findings. This is, this is theirs. And so we're going to have some kind of mutual negotiations about things like timeline. Um, the maintainers might say, we prefer to disclose on a 90-day timeline. Researcher might say, mm, I'd really actually like 15 for these reasons. You go, OK, 15 it is. If the project hasn't patched and disclosed by that 15, those 15 days, the researcher is free to you know, share their finding how they see fit. Um, so it's kind of a balancing of that model. Things can get a little bit complicated, which is why for open source projects, we developed this guide to CVD. Uh, if this is kind of new information for you, I would recommend finding time before there's a very an active <laughs> vulnerability in your project to read through the guide. And then when you do have that, there's a run book if you need that kind of reminder checklist of steps, things to do. And we also made a lot of communication templates that are in a directory in this GitHub repo. Mm -hmm. and, and from a... Um, from an ecosystem perspective, uh, you, you'll hear oh, there is no the open source and operates the open source way. Every project and community is unique. They have their own tooling, practices, communication, kind of acceptable norms. But in general, when you're looking at open source software, and Ann and I just had a presentation where we had some interesting statistics about how many projects have dependencies and dependencies upon dependencies. And the understanding is no software exists in an island. And there's very often a uh, community of potentially uh, collaborators, contributors to your project that might depend on your software, or uh, some major downstream ecosystems potentially that need to have uh, the time and ability to potentially take and ingest uh, the first-hand patches and maybe make alterations in backport or just potentially get it deployed to a wide fleet because ultimately the goal of CVD is to ensure that no end user of the software or hardware is put more at risk than any other group. So everyone has opportunity to apply the fixes at the same time so that no one group can be attacked more than another. And that's why you will see uh, some passionate conversations around uh, maintaining privacy around issues, at least until an idea of how an issue is being going to be fixed. Anything more to add, Art? A um, couple of thoughts. The one I can remember most easily is, um, and, and you sort of covered this, there's not one single open source way to do things. But um, from, from my role where, you know, in, in one sense, we're agnostic to what software has the vulnerability. It can be very proprietary, it can be very open, it can be a mix. Um, the open source community generalization actually means the word open pretty seriously. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes the, the, pro the projects uh, or, the, or the, uh, the software's policy is file it in our public GitHub. It's a zero, zero embargo. We don't care. We'll get to it when we get to it. Mm -hmm. And saying they don't care isn't quite the right right phrase, but they have a very open process and they may even document this. And the answer is file a GitHub issue. You can say security if you want, but it's just going to be dealt with in the open. Yep. Which, you know, a zero embargo is sort of a self-zero day situation. But again, if that's the maintainers uh, and, the, and the project's um, policy, that might be okay. And whether or not I think it's okay, if that's how they're going to work on it, we still want this fixed. So um, mm -hmm. you, may, you may go with a zero, uh, zero embargo. And then I remembered, um, yes, I think, I think Anne, this is your point, right? We, I spent a lot of my time deep in embargoes and counting down days and thinking how secure we're being. I sometimes lose sight of the fact that probably somebody else found this and just mm -hmm. hasn't been talking about it loudly. And sometimes after the fact, we look back and see evidence that indeed someone else did know about it while it was under embargo. So, there are certainly classes of threat actor that are sharp enough to have discovered things, and in the big picture, they do. Um, so your embargo might not be as secret as you think it is. I try to keep that in mind. On the other hand, um, the, the, the whole goal of the embargo is a risk reduction, right? Somewhere in that middle of the line is an optimal. It's not perfect. Um, if you can keep the exploit sort of off the public uh, view and off of Twitter and off of uh, Metasploit for a few weeks, that actually limits a certain class of attacker who's just going to grab public stuff. Uh, you know, plenty of ransomware that 
is costing people money, just uses a bunch of known already patched uh, vulnerabilities, which is a whole different problem. But uh, um, there is some risk reduction in that embargo, we think, or I think, just that, yes, some attackers are going to always sort of know better. But you know, if you can cut off maybe the 80%, uh, the old term used to be script kitty, but I don't know what you talk about, what you say these days. The, <laughs> but a general purpose, saying. right, general purpose background noise, crimeware, rough class of adversary, mm -hmm. the embargo might help with that. And if nothing else, uh, Ann and I work with the uh, security vulnerability, security disclosures working group within the OpenSSF and who created this guide. And our big advice to maintainers and communities is it doesn't matter what your thoughts are around how you want to handle uh, security issues. The most important thing is you talk about it and agree upon it as a project and as a community. And please document that Thank so you. that consumers understand what your community's rules are and so that reporters know. Um, because you may have a reporter that's just interested in trying to get is, is altruistic and just wants something fixed and reports it to a community that potentially might zero day itself. So it's important that you know if you have policies that a bug is a bug is a bug and we're just going to fix it in the open, just make sure you have that documented so that as people are trying to work with you and report responsibly that uh, they understand kind of how that your community works. Oh, we have this. So we have, uh, we put together some interesting uh, good ideas around CVD and some things to look out for. So for example, uh, generally within the industry, uh, especially if you're working with a, a commercial entity that has any kind of planned release schedule, you'll typically see uh, requests for embargoes in the, the 14, 30, 60, or 90 day windows. So if you're a reporter coming in and uh, asking a project to fix something, you'll very typically see th these types of things. So just understand what works best for your community and your project. Uh, we strongly recommend that as vulnerabilities are reported that you get a CVE identifier so that your downstream and actual end users can understand what that issue is and what they need to do to fix it. And there's a lot of different ways you can get that. Um, your project potentially is a uh, CVE. It's a, an entity allowed to give out a CVE identifiers. So you could contact, um, it's, is it still MITRE? Uh, it, the CVE program would be the proper term. You can contact the CVE program directly through a web form to request it. It could take about five minutes or so to get a CVE now. A lot of different ways, or maybe you have um, some third party that does your CVE uh, assignments your, for your project. A lot of different ways, but it's a recognized good practice that if there is a security vulnerability, you need to find some way to identify that so the consumers of your software can understand what they need to do to fix it. Uh, it's also strongly encouraged that you publish some type of advisory. It doesn't need to be a, a long, 20-page uh, treatise on the state of global security, but you need to uh, inform your downstream that this is a bug, this is the CVE, this is the patch version, or if there's other tech, other things that need done to correct that flaw. So you have that documented, you give it in some type of uh, format, preferably machine-readable like a CSAF or OVAL or something like that. And um, it is very typical that after a researcher reports a vulnerability to you, depending on the severity of it, that they're probably going to either do a tweet, do a blog, potentially uh, get their PhD around it, or they might present at a conference. So these are very typical things in the research community. So just be prepared and understand if your project needs to do any additional preparations around this type of thing. Do you want to talk about the bad stuff, Anne? Sure. And I'll just add one thing on the, uh, the conference bit. You know, I think sometimes it can surprise people that security researchers, when we're talking about timeline negotiation, they say, no, no, or I really need to hit the state. And you're kind of going, as a maintainer, what? Who cares about a conference? If you're a security researcher, depending on you know, your career path, that is actually very, a very important place to get your work recognized and credited. Mm -hmm. So um, sometimes that strikes folks as odd, but in that career path, that's a really important thing. Uh, so things that you know you kind of should kind of raise your heckles a little bit. Uh, asking you for money, and this is outside of you know you're not in a bug bounty. Some people call this a big bounty. Uh, th there should not be any sort of extortion or bribery. 
if you are not participating in a documented vulnerability disclosure program that has cash rewards, if it's not part of a bug bounty where this is in scope, um, somebody asking you for money should... Sketchy. Yeah, a little, little sketchy. Uh, probably should not engage and just prepare yourself. If this is really real, there might be a zero day against your project. Um, similarly, if you know, you're asking for, can you, uh, you know, you're, as part of going through the a recreation of the vulnerability yourself to make sure and verify it, if they're asking for privileged access to your systems or infrastructure to do this, also sketchy. Um, if you get something, they say, no, no, just, just run this. I swear this is what I did. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, hard, hard pass on that one. Uh, any sort of, you know, NDA or legal agreement. And again, I know some bug bounty programs have NDAs if people choose to participate in that. But if you haven't set that up as the maintainer, you shouldn't be signing anything, uh, you know, to get this from the researcher. Um, and this is where we know, again, if we go back to that model, this one's got a little caveat. So researcher dropping zero day without basic things being met, like really trying to attempt to contact you. Uh, you know, if you're going back and forth about, well, we weren't able to recreate this, and they say, no, no, I swear it is, and you kind of have that conversation. Um, and if they don't do those things and they drop it anyways, that can be a little odd. However, if they are someone, a researcher, who uh, really abides by the full disclosure model and that's how they operate, then that would not be unusual. So Correct. that's the one where that's a little mm -hmm. bit of a caveat. Anything else good or bad you observed, Art? Yeah, just a bit on, uh, on the you know, researcher trying uh, earnestly. That's the word you have up there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, to uh, uh, earnest attempt to reach the, the project. Um, very often, reaching an open source project is shockingly much easier, maybe not shockingly, than uh, reaching a uh, proprietary or closed source uh, vendor or supplier. Um, so that's a huge plus. Nonetheless, um, in this policy that you have, and have documented already about your desired embargoes, please include sort of how you want to receive the issue. Even when we deal with an open source project, it's often we might post something publicly and say, hey, we have a security report. How would you like it? How would you like to receive it? Please just save that trouble and just say, you know, use GitHub security advisories or PGP adhere or send it to our bug bounty or Dropbox, post whatever. drop it. But if you can just make that part of that initial document, a reasonably professional, mature researcher or reporter is going to find that and they'll just follow it. Mm -hmm. All right, let's move on to our next question. We've mentioned a couple of these terms. Could I ask the panel to explain the difference between CVD? VDP and bug bounty. Who'd like to start? You got squinty eyes. I'll, uh, I, Is that I'm, enthusiasm or no? I'm squinting. Fear. Uh, not fear. I'm squinting. So the CVD VDP difference is the most squinty to okay. me. So um, uh, I will. I, my opinion, right? So uh, CVD, right? Coordinating the disclosure is sort of a general thing. Mm -hmm. um, it's probably the most umbrella of the, of the three terms, I guess I would say. Uh, I treat a VDP as a official, very official project that someone is operating. Uh, VDP typically does not have uh, money compensation involved. Um, there might be a you know Hall of Fame web page or stickers or something. Or thanks okay, afterwards. Like thanks yeah. afterwards. But nonetheless, VDP is good because you someone's running a scope and saying whether it's um, whether it's my software products or my systems or in the case of the uh, Department of Defense runs a VDP for the DOD, uh, and I forget what their scope is, but it keeps increasing a little bit every time I check. Um, they're more of an operator running, running a VDP. And to step back, CVD stands for Coordinated Vulnerability Disclosure, and I agree yeah. with Art. It's a description generally of a set of good practices. Yeah. VDP is a Vulnerability Disclosure Program. Correct. Or policy. It depends. I go with program, but sure. Yeah, yeah so yeah. Th there is some organization around collecting, triaging, and responding to. And I, I guess I would say that it's desirable that a VDP practices CVD or encourages mm -hmm. it, although they can't control the actions of, of others involved. And then briefly, Bug Bounty is an official program, and it might be a, it's commonly you can outsource this, right, because there's an international payment involved, possibly, and you want to outsource the payment part for sure. Mm -hmm. um, right? The bugs of this nature will receive this level of compensation and there are some more terms the researchers probably agreeing to going into it in order to be rewarded, compensated for, uh, for the finding. Um, 
interesting, entirely interesting topic, bug bounty in these days, always, but these days mm -hmm. again. Uh, so my version of the differences. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did we throw another slide after this? We'll see. But I was oh. going to say, <laughs> normally, bug bounty is associated with a commercial entity. So a corporation that provides goods and services to people that pay money for it. Um, open source projects can, and some do, elect kind of outsource their vulnerability management to these third parties. Um, otherwise, open source projects might be contacted by these organizations saying we have a researcher that found a problem in your project click this link to log into our system to learn more and that's again it's it's a reality that projects um, don't necessarily have to have their own bug bounty but it is a reality you may encounter that as you're you know working in your community and releasing your software i would say for maintainers you know, uh, I like to think about these in terms of kind of this maturity timeline. Mm -hmm. And you are not ready for a bug bounty program if you don't have a smooth process. Yeah. And I think, you know, with the advent of these bug bounty vendors, it's very common and easy for maintainers uh. to go, oh, we need a vulnerability solution. I'm going to Google something. Hey, this program is here. Let's sign up for it. And, you know, and we think about the difference of the ethos, uh, VDP, program is kind of the, you know, if you see something, please let us know, versus a bug bounty is I'm going to dangle cash and actively incentivize you to go look for a particular set of vulnerabilities that are in scope. It might actually be leaving out things because they're lower paying but do affect your project. Those are very different kind of takes to that. And I think there's umpteen examples of projects signing up for bug bounty programs, not realizing that now they are turning a fire hose on on themselves for potentially you know, a lot of the same report, false reports, um, you're not ready for that if you don't have a smooth practice process. Absolutely. All right, let's see if we have another slide. We don't. Ha <laughs> ha. We cut it. All right, so our next question is, um, from your perspectives, what are some common challenges you see in the coordinated vulnerability disclosure? And this could be, in, uh, for example, or you see, you recognize a bad practice. Um, so who would like to start on this? Oh, I can go with a, a go right or just the general the challenges piece. trying to do yeah, this. Yeah, it's a nice yeah. yeah, we've talked a little bit about timelines, um, but I think that is a frequent challenge is that people who, maintainers of projects misunderstand the dynamic with a researcher. Uh, by choosing to contact you, even attempting to contact you, they've already done you a favor. The first answer is always thank you. No matter what happens after that, the first thing is always should be thank you. Um, and then when we get into timeline, you know, sometimes I've seen projects say, oh, well, we, we're just not ready to sort this out in seven days, 15 days. We always like 90. It's like, well, that's, that's not your choice. Uh, if the researcher agrees to that, then excellent, you get your 90. If they don't, they don't. And that's just kind of the dynamic of this. Um, so that's a common challenge I see. I'll also note while you're talking about timelines, generally the researcher controls the timeline. But that doesn't mean that the, the maintainer or the project is completely uh, helpless. You, you do have the ability to negotiate. Or you can say, you know, we're planning our next major release. We're going to include this fix in that. Or, you know, maybe you're super agile and you can deploy a fix in a couple hours and, you know, the timeline might not be an option. Or if holding it for that conference is uh, like a testing problem, if you write the fix and then you have a lot of builds in between, it's challenging to continually do regression testing on this patch you're holding. So just it, it feel if you're contacted by a researcher, um, you don't necessarily have to accept the date they say as gospel. You have some negotiation. You have some. You have the ability to, to push back and help, you know, massage and coordinate something that is amicable to your project as well. That's that's a great point. I should add that you know, if you're in this negotiation, explain why mm -hmm. that you have your change in timeline. Uh, just saying we're not. We can't move that fast. Is doesn't usually is not sufficient. But if it's something like uh, we're working on this patch and we're, we're going to miss this deadline because we just don't think this fully mitigates the issue, a lot of researchers are sympathetic to that and you know, happy to work with you and extend it because you're actively trying to fix this. Mm -hmm. couple, of, couple of points. Um, I know of at least one open source project uh, where um, they're the ones sort of driving the timeline. So if I'm a researcher or my, my role is coordinator, I forgot, mm -hmm. and I come and say 45 days, which is our 
very soft but starting point uh, at search CC. Uh, this vendor says, nope, uh, it'll be out tomorrow. <laughs> so they fix aggressively and quickly, and that's their more or less known policy. So um, the, the, the fundamental piece to keep in mind is anyone with knowledge of the not yet public vulnerability has one leverage point, which is the power to publish. Um, and that can be the researcher, that can be one of the projects, if it's a multi-vendor, multi-supplier mm -hmm. issue. Ecosystem, yeah. um, it can be one of the three reporter researchers who found it. So um, that is the one leverage point. Typically, people don't get too fighty about, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drop this if you don't act, but that is the implication. Uh, and to your points, right, it, often reasonable people can negotiate and discuss things. And if there's good faith and reasons for things, that goes a long way. Um, radio silence does not go a long way and will get you uh, published on. So. What other opportunities have you seen during coordination? If you don't have an idea, I have one in my head. Oh yeah, sure. Um, well, the you know mistake or challenge is uh, the researcher might be really interested in patching this. I think sometimes maintainers assume that the researcher has submitted this to me and then they're out, they're done, and maybe that's how they want to operate. But I always encourage maintainers to ask the researcher, "Would you like to be involved in the patching of this?" Yes. That's you know our next step, mm -hmm. uh, because they might actually have some ideas. They might have you know already kind of started tinkering of here's what would mitigate this, and if in open source, nobody can really say no to help. Uh, but you know, it's may, just ask. I've seen uh, maintainers accidentally offend researchers by not even asking because they just assumed it would be bothering them. And uh, I kind of go on the you know, give all the options to to the researcher. I had to write this down so I would not forget it from at least seven minutes previous. But um, <laughs> right, right on this topic. Uh, um, even if the researcher or reporter maybe isn't going to write the patch, uh, ask them to test the fix. It's a great, a great mm -hmm. time saver. Um, and even if you're under, if it's the, you know, the zero day time pressure issue we started off with, right? Public disclosure, no maintainer uh, prior knowledge, off to the races. Under that pressure, you might write a quick patch and it might be complete, might not be complete, it might have a side effect. Um, hard to do, but even under stress, under time pressure, uh, test fixes, and the researcher knows something. Hopefully they gave you a proof of concept or steps to reproduce. If they didn't, that's also a sign. They, they should be doing that to be professional. Um, ask them to test. And again, their, their involvement, now it's a team thing, you're working together, way better dynamic than silence or, uh, or fighting. So, I'd say for, from my experience, probably the single biggest complication of a smooth uh, disclosure is a lack of communication. So, for example, a project may be uh, may not have a security policy published. They might not have a, a web page or a mailing list or any way. It's very hard for the researcher to contact them. And uh, so, as the researcher is going around, and they might go to a third-party coordinator like Art. They might contact a bug bounty program. But um, if your project doesn't have a means with which you can communicate with the public, or at least say questions to this address or it, we were in Discord or Slack or wherever your community lives. Um, that complicates things. And then once you've, once a communication has been established, it's in um, the project's best interest to be as communicative as possible, saying, yes, researcher, we got your report. We're going to triage it. It's going to take us three days, three hours, five days, whatever it is. We will contact you again on this date. So being as communicative as possible, because sometimes the researcher finds things that are uh, very corner case, very esoteric, hard to reproduce. Um, but don't uh, don't feel bad if you, you know, as long as you're communicating with them, you are less likely having that zero day dropped on you saying, you know what, we can't reproduce this. Can you give us an example configuration? We need more information or our, you know, the guy, the guy or gal that works on that subsystem has these questions. So just feel free to be communicative and always state, you know, our next, I will talk with you again on this day or time or within this time span and follow up. If you don't do that, that again encourages the researchers maybe negative perceptions of slacker developers and they may proceed to uh, publicly disclose, which we don't want. We want, want the project to have as much ability to uh, manage this uh, this remediation as possible. 
any other kind of gotchas that you've seen or heard of? I don't know if we have a slide on this, but so far, mm -hmm. I, we haven't strictly stuck to this, but we have this, you know, there's a reporter or a researcher and there's a project. Um, and you hinted this, you, you touched this earlier, but often these days there's not one project. There are multiple projects, and those projects have components used by proprietary vendors. And it's not one embargo discussion, it's whatever, one to the end, I forget the math on how many parties you have involved, but it's not a good number. Um, that gets messy very, very quickly. Um, I'll venture to say there's not a good known solution to that problem. Um, we honestly, state of the art practice is we uh, try to, one of our roles is a multi-party coordination when a third party is useful, right? So it's not one project or one researcher or one of the vendors trying to run the show potentially. Um, there's, you know, we're, a third party might be funded to do this and paid to at their job professionally, and that actually takes some of the stress off. Well, who's who's picking? Are you biased towards your own choices? You can blame the third party for uh, for any choices or mistakes or anything like that. But multi-party is a big mess. Um, we they can be done reasonably successfully, um, but uh, it's sort of a uh, a manual process at this point every time. So yeah, many many projects involved, and these are these are supply chain mm -hmm. issues, right? A dependent component, others use it. More downstream, everyone has to figure out if they're affected by you know, log4j upstream or OpenSSL upstream, or pick your pick your popular library of choice. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, I lost my train of thought. Oh, Let's spend I a hope line. I didn't. I hope I didn't break the no. flow. Is another slide? No. But, yeah. Okay. Our next question, let's talk about some lessons learned. What, what practices have we seen that work within, um, whether it's uh, closed or preferably open source? So what have you seen that works that uh, other projects might be able to learn from? Oh, God. Well, you, you stole my favorite about communication. Because, oh. um, you know, I think that that is just the biggest thing is learning the, that researchers are not scary. Uh, you know, we said it before, I'll say it again, that they're contacting you, they want to see a good outcome. I think sometimes people who don't work in security get nervous, the, all the stereotypes and kind of myths about who works in security. Um, they, they want a good outcome. They want to work with you. So communication, asking questions, sharing information, um, all, all that is good. From my perspective, um, and we've, I've seen it with evidence over the years, as a project, matures, they have more capabilities, um, typically carving off part of your team or having people do double duty where you have dedicated people that do the security work of the project, a, a, a security team, so to speak, um, that is helpful because it can offload some of the work of maybe the mainline maintainers as opposed to contributors. Having your project be able to portion, you know, route some of the work to these security experts that can handle some of the, the nuances of you know, getting a CVE, writing the advisory, coordinating the testing of the fixes, kind of offloading that off of the main developers. That's a, a good practice, and that definitely can help. And that's, you know, we've, we've seen this with Kernel and Kubernetes and OpenStack and Apache and, 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 and. There's a lot of really good examples. And not everybody has a foundation uh, backing them. You might be a one- or two-person project. But there's also a, a lot of good publicly available resources, like what we're producing through the OpenSSF, there's a lot of, of security experts within the open source community that can help, you can lean on if you need assistance. What good have you seen, Art? Anything else? Um, I mean, we've covered some of this. Really, uh, if, if on the, as a maintainer, if you can just do a couple of basic things, have your, have your, your desired reporting path published, uh, a security.txt or just the security.md. MD. What's the, what's the uh, right? MD. Either one of the, both of them, maybe. Um, they can say the same thing, maybe. Anyway. Yeah. Um, Don't have them say different things. Well, <laughs> sure. Yes. No, no, you, you would not publish one policy, not two that conflict. Yes. I mean, uh, that, actually, that is a thing to, uh, yeah, for some reason you do have two policies. I've seen them go well, all right, yeah. out of sync. But anyways, continue yeah. on, Art. As a maintainer, if you want security reports to come in a certain way, just say so and publish it and make sure that's findable. You'll just save a lot, a lot of back and forth email round trips right off the bat by providing someone a front door. And then you just said this, but um, if a reporter is coming to you, the researcher is coming to you, 
that already is a big signal that they're kind of trying to help because they could just sit on it. They could sell it to uh, try to try to shop a bug bounty. They could try to shop to a more offensive sort of broker, depending on the nature of the vulnerability. Um, they could do nothing with it, which is all those are worse outcomes than them telling you. So that's a pretty strong signal they want to do something helpful. And they may not want to do much more. They may want to hand it off and drop. That's fine. But mm -hmm. it's, it's worth asking and offering. That offer of help and that sharing is, I mean, that's, that's the human. You want to help? I would like your help. You're great. Human sharing contact. is caring. Sharing is caring. I think your slide said it wasn't earlier. <laughs> but it is sometimes. <laughs> yes. All right. Let me see. So um, we have some real quick recommendations. And then we'll get on the, if any, the audience has any questions. But first off, have a security policy. That's kind of our the single most impactful thing you can do. It costs you electrons on your source code repository, and that's it. Documenting your expectations, your process, and how to communicate with you. Being contactable, having a security at project email address is very helpful. That's uh, very typical in the vendor community. So most commercial vendors will have security at Intel, security at Microsoft as being contactable. So if your project can emulate that, that's a very well-known convention. Again, you're going to be casting a wider net, collecting things, because uh, researchers might not do their due diligence and find you on you know, GitLab, GitLab Hub, and, or whatever you know, mail forum you guys lurk on. Um, remember, feedback is a gift, and first mention this. They, their intention almost always is to make things better. They might have other things on their agenda, like it's going to get their, them their PhD, or they get a conference talk, or they get to put another CVE notch on their belt. But it, the first thing is they're trying to help. They found a problem, they're saying something. Um, communicate along the way, ask questions that you don't understand. And just to kind of help the overall security profile of your project, depending on what your source code management repository is, there's a lot of really great tools that help you manage the security of your dependencies, that do vulnerability scanning, that do static analysis, fuzzing. There's a lot of really good tools that are completely automatable, and a lot of them um, also interact with your developer IDEs. So they could be right there helping provide advice while you're typing code. And we have uh, how we're ready for questions. So does anyone have any questions or comments? Sir. So the, while Art is thinking, because he has the most data, I'll rephrase the question. So we show, displayed a spectrum of different styles of uh, disclosing vulnerabilities. And uh, the gentleman asked, is there any evidence to show uh, how any of those are performing? Is one observably uh, better through data uh, than another? And you know, Cert CC does a lot of this work. So he might have the e easiest access to data. Yeah. Um, the data is like a lot of security data. No, sometimes sort of, you know, our, we have our own cases, but that's a very small sort of subset, and it's probably very biased in, in the way we get we get things reported to us. Um, I keep a I have a printout somewhere of a paper from a while back from some CMU professors, uh, and they have a nice curve, and it's sort of. Uh, it, it's based on some data at the time. Uh, this would have been CVE, and from, from this is 15 years old, probably at least. They have sort of a utility, greater good, societal good curve. And you know, never reporting the bug is sort of an infinite badness. And dropping the zero day is pretty bad. And you know, somewhere, uh, they sort of thought that our 45 day number was good at the time, but that, that may have been a, a data bias problem, is, is a sweet spot, right? Um, I'm not familiar with anything that really nails this down. And I think one of the big factors is uh, there are so many different sort of kinds of software and software systems. So if you have a room full of uh, uh, industrial control and operational, operational tech people, they don't want to change their working stuff because bad things happen. And they, have, they may have hardware replacement lifetime cycles for updating software. They would like to have years for disclosure embargoes, right? and then OpenBSD will fix it as fast as Theo <laughs> wants to, and that is the answer, and you can 
live with that or not. Like matter. it or love it. No, so <laughs> it, there, there are really different kinds of software. There may not be a one answer, but I have this almost permanently etched in my head curve where there's a, uh, even on a the line there, you know, closer towards the faster release, you know, a quarter way into that line, there's some optimum. It's not very scientific, but it's, it's there somewhere, I think. Yeah. And, and I think the labels we chose yeah. were kind of arbitrary. They're sure. colloquialisms. And when you're going through a disclosure, at the end of it, you don't go back and mark this, oh, this was, you know, uh, totally coordinated, or this yeah. was, you know, totally private. And so there hasn't been a lot of record keeping on that meticulous. But I think it'd be an interesting area of study. Yeah. Sure, you could cut it up by, sure, it's, yeah, it's split industry. Up that way and it, it will be limited, but again, we've got years of, and maybe needs more decorations for the data, but I, I, in the spirit of openness and transparency, I definitely think it's a, something we, we should talk yeah. about. Yeah, I think it's very interesting. Uh, Mr. Wheeler, do you have something to add to this? I'm sorry, Dr. Wheeler, do you have anything to add to this? An observation and a question, but I have to new topic. Okay. Yes, we agree. It's a good idea. We, I, we'll take some notes. Thank you. Go, go ahead, David. Yeah, uh, quick, quick note. Um, one of the main reasons that people don't burn an open SSF best practices guide when they first try is because they're not telling anybody how to report. So we as developers have a ways to go in telling people how to report vulnerabilities. Um, so oh, pause for a second. So David mentioned that there is a tool <laughs> called the Open SSF. Uh, best practices badge that developers are able to showcase how goodly they do security. And one of the ways that they, you don't earn that badge is by having it be difficult or not able to contact you for security issues. And then what was your second point, sir? Okay, so the actual, my actual question, except it's still shift, um, my question involves actually making real changes to vulnerabilities. There's way too many cases where a vulnerability report reported, thank you, there was a fix, but it didn't actually, it may have fixed the specific example, but didn't fix it. I'm thinking shell shock, I'm thinking loss for shell, you know, where we fixed it, and then we have the other fixes that fixed it. So Is there anything we can do to make this better <laughs> so that the actual fix that goes up fixes the problem? Test fixes even under time pressure. <laughs> but it, that you need to do better than what does test mean, right? How many people are, do they know the tech very well? Um, Usually, what happens is a small tweak in the exploit means it works again. It's, it's too narrow. Yeah, breaking, narrow breaking, concept. patching the exploit, breaking the exploit's a common thing, and yeah. the, the the closed source world makes this mistake all the time. As well, it's not an open source specific thing. So, and, and I'll note, and like the log for JK specifically, while downstream it was frustrating that the first fix wasn't a full fix, and within 24 hours, a second patch was released that remediated the totality of the initial issue. I think that's pretty amazing from an open source perspective. We should be proud how reactive we can be when we need to be, and we recognize that the first fix wasn't comprehensive, and they went back and did additional work without being asked or waiting for someone to find it again. But it, yes, that, and that is something that could be measurable, how many uh, regressions uh, there were from an initial patch. But, uh, you know, I think as yeah, Art fix, said, yeah. testing, 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 testing. T testing with a mind towards, right, that attacker point of view of, I'm going to just, you know, make a small change and still bypass your fix. So you need, you need that knowledge, sorry. Um, uh, who's next? Oh, who's next? You go ahead. Right. Straight in the back. Yeah. So to rephrase your statement, um, generally when a, you're working with a researcher, they have much more, have thought about the issue much more than the maintainer developer has. The developer is going to get the problem, react to it, try to fix it. But ideally, the researcher has a lot more knowledge potentially and can provide a lot more feedback. And directly to that point, Ann and I, the working group we're in in the OpenSSF, 
uh, the Vulnerability Disclosures Working Group. We're working on a new coordinated vulnerability disclosure guide and it's focused on the finder persona. So we are giving recommended good practice to researchers and I'd be glad to specifically get that added in that you know you collaborate with the maintainer, provide help, test, test, test. So I'd be glad if you want to provide me some more uh, definitive wording, I'd be glad to get that put in the guide. There's one of our gentlemen right here. The No, sure. We have a, um, a virtual question. From oh, attendee. is it from Dylan? It is. It is. Ha <laughs> <laughs> It's a plant. All right. <laughs> Okay, have you seen examples of reporters or partners with CVD being excluded or ignored for disclosing in bad faith? Is there a reputational cost <laughs> that comes due for bad behavior? Uh, thanks, lady. Um, open source is an amazing community where uh, you're able to uh, produce work and your peers get to provide you feedback on it, and hard work and good quality code gets rewarded. In the same vein, if you are a, a bad partner, and if you uh, leak information that's shared to you, or you uh, immediately disclose early, that there potentially are rep repercussions, because this is an ecosystem. We live in communities, and you need to be respectful of your neighbors in that community. And Yes, in the existence of the open source, uh, there have been some people that uh, have damaged their reputation and their inclusion in, in helping uh, fix some of these things because of their uh, unprofessional and uncommunity-like behavior. So it, it exists. It's very definitely the rarity. Uh, the, you know, normally, when uh, people get included in trying to help fix these kind of things, uh, people are very professional. They react pretty quickly. But you know, sometimes uh, we're all human, and sometimes some humans are nicer than others. But I think showing the, the humanness is an important thing that works well. You know, when mistakes are made, like mm -hmm. this, this is this is a process between a lot of people and mm -hmm. parties, and mistakes will be people made. Make mistakes. Um, reputational damage has real outcomes. I can tell you the story of a project. Oh, yes. I can tell you the story of a project that you know they were nervous about something. Uh, and as we were talking about, you know, afraid to ask the bother the maintainer, or excuse me, bother the researcher, they were afraid to bother the researcher and kind of fell into that radio silent mode, uh, just trying to do what they thought was the right thing. And the researcher was very frustrated, like, what's going on, what's going on? And, you know, the maintainer wrote back eventually and said, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to be radio silent for so long. I thought I was bothering you. Here's where things are at. We can't figure out how to patch this. And they worked together. But in that interaction, the researcher said, you know, thank you for saying that because I was planning to never report to you again because prior to this, this sucked. <laughs> and so I think just, you know, sharing those things mm -hmm. and um, repairing those relationships is really important because it, that reporter was not going to come back. And if you ever are involved in some type of private disclosure, uh, provide feedback, how you're, yeah, this worked well for me, this didn't work for our community, and you know, in the future we're gonna change our rules. Um, so just provide feedback to everyone involved, especially uh, you know, if you see areas for opportunity, if you're involved in a very big coordination, provide that feedback so the next time we can do it better for everybody, for the next group of folks that potentially are impacted. My straight man. Uh, so uh, those of you that were here for OpenSSF Day or have been in any of the OpenSSF talks, we released a 10-point mobilization plan where we are proposing back to uh, the ecosystem, 
here are 10 specific areas we can uh, concentrate our on and help improve the overall security posture of all open source communities in the ecosystem. So uh, specific to your question, and the question was, is there going to be a platform with which to help ease some of these communication and coordination problems? And that issue is dealt with uh, Stream 5, which is um, lovingly titled the OSS CERT, Security Incident Response Team. So uh, myself and members of the community, and it's open to anyone that's interested in helping collaborate on it, we're going to try to focus in on these specific issues. And one of the first things we're looking at is the uh, CERT CC's Vince platform, which was just recently open sourced. And that's a tool that a lot of commercial vendors today use to coordinate these complex multi-party disclosures. And we think that potentially this could be a good platform for anyone in open source to use because it allows you to, allows the researcher to report to a maintainer and then the maintainer to include other parties they feel need to be involved in that conversation and kind of help set the rules and tone. And then you could include experts like from this new OSS cert to potentially help with advisories or negotiation of a timeline if that's needed or um, you know, just trying to track down additional people that might, need, might be needed to help uh, warn or maybe subject matter expertise to write a patch potentially. So we are working on this. So if anyone's interested, that's um, the open source uh, mobilization plan and stream five. And we start, work, we start uh, group meetings the first week of July. And we hope to actually start to take action on this before the end of this calendar year. Thanks. You're welcome. Any additional questions or comments? Sir. Mm -hmm. um, so the question was, how, how do we feel if there's a vulnerability and it's discovered that it's being actively exploited during the embargo period? The embargo is over. Yep. And it's off to the races. Right? Yeah. And ideally, people have enough warning that they've prepared at least some type of advisory or statement. We are aware of this problem and we're actively working on a fix. So there will be times, and if it is ever noted that it's publicly abused, the embargo is off and everyone is kind of uh, hopefully able to inform their constituents of what their plan is and potentially what an ETA for a fix might be. Mm -hmm. Sir. And in that case, even if there's no fix, are there other mitigation options? Mm -hmm. so Sometimes. Yeah, and the statement there was, um, even if there is not a fix available and the embargo breaks, we always should try to provide additional advice for compensating controls, firewalls, any kind of um, IDS type Protection. rules, anything to help, any alternative mitigations until that actual software fix is done. Excellent feedback, thank you. Other questions? All right, so we've, I've had this up here, Blinding Ann. This is how you can get a hold of us um, here at the OpenSSF. Uh, a lot of different ways, we have a lot of different working groups. Um, the mobilization plan has 10 work streams that will eventually be incorporated in those working groups. But uh, you can get a hold of us on GitHub. Uh, the webpage is OpenSSF.org. Uh, we have a YouTube channel where you can watch hours and hours of working group meetings. It's great. Uh, we have Slack channel. Um, in all of our working group meetings, the Slack channel is all open. So if you're interested in contributing to try to solve these problems or you have ideas or suggestions or comments, this is all open to the public. We invite you to come uh, join the conversation with us. So with that, uh, thank you very much. We have a disclosure guide we talked about. There's some other really great uh, resources. I'll make, try to make this available through SCED if I can figure out how to get a PDF on my phone. And that's it. So uh, thank you very much. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you all.